Welcome back, as always, Metal Summoners, to another fantastic episode of the Metal Summit here on your island of Misfit Toys with all of your insane Misfit Toys of Bobby Dreyer, Angel Alamo, and the Jew for you, Psycho Steve. We always appreciate you guys tuning in with us every single week. For anybody who's brand new to the Metal Summit, we are a completely fan interactive show. Make sure that you get your comments, your questions for the guest of honor right into the comments because we will have multiple segments where your questions do get answered to you directly. So anybody new to us, definitely participate and we're happy to have you guys. On that note, we are very happy to have this guy joining yeah. us for the first time on this show with a whole lot that we get to talk about. Basis extraordinaire, Tim Gaines, how are you, sir? Hey, how's it going, guys? Good, man. Hey. Good. We're super awesome, man. duper happy to have you, man. And first and foremost, man, how's 2022 treating you so far? So far, so good. What are we, the 19th in? And uh, everything's great. Everything's <laughs> awesome, great. It's still vertical. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, for sure. So uh, talk a, so talk a little bit about what you're uh, looking to hopefully do when it comes to like 2022. Are you uh, currently working on music? Are you kind of jamming with guys, bands that you're involved with? Kind of how um, you know, you know are, what's 2022 I, shaping up for, barring any any blockage? Yeah, well, um, right now we're just everybody's kind of waiting to see what happens with lockdowns and if they're going to open up, you know, for getting out and playing again. I mean, you know, that's the main thing. I, I'm just, I'm in the middle of looking for uh, work. Um, I just finished uh, working with Alda Nova. And uh, Very cool. he, he's been great. And uh, we we had planned touring uh, last year or, or, or the year before now, I guess. And, and uh, things didn't pan out because of the pandemic. So uh, as of a year ago, January, I, I told him I just, I can't commit to this this coming year i got family issues and things yeah. that i just can't get away you know and get stuck on the border you know in quarantine and stuff like that so anyways he's he's got a new album that's coming out i think in uh uh march or april and uh we're looking forward to that and uh, other than that i'm just uh not doing a lot you know just kind of waiting to see what happens with everything Awesome, man, for sure. When it comes to that new Aldo Nova album, though, um, are did you participate on it and everything? Yeah, I Aldo does uh, everything. I I did some tracking with him, uh, and if it ends up on the album, I'm not sure if it will or not. But uh, you know, I'm hoping that that something uh, uh, ends up on the album, and uh, we'll see. Uh, as of right now, I I don't know, but uh, gotcha. We'll see. No problem. Absolutely, brother. Yeah, definitely. Well, we can always hope for that because that'll be super duper awesome to get to hear you playing on those records, man, because we definitely miss hearing you play, whether it be live or on records for sure, man. But Psycho Steve, let's bring you in, brother. Well, first of all, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank so you. we talked about it before the show we started. Uh, first time I saw you is when you were with Striper. Saw you with Striper, TNT, and Loudness at the club that's no longer, I think it's like a restaurant or something now in Brooklyn called the yeah. yeah. So now back in the day when bands got signed, they got in advance. Usually it went towards, of course, most of it went to the record to record it, produce it, engineer it, fund it and everything. However, sometimes you did get a little pocket change left over. So sure. the question is for your first advance, what did you get and what did you buy? Gosh, the first money I ever got with Striper, I think I, I bought a Jeep. Cool. Like the one that car, you posted like, on your Instagram, the CJ7 or whatever, that Wrangler? Yeah, it, it was a black one. Uh, it was a, it's called a Scrambler. It was kind of like the, what the yeah. you know, pickup truck version, what they, they look like, uh, like a regular Jeep, but with a, a bed in the back. And so that was my first, my first big purchase that I got. Uh, yeah. And that was probably, uh, I don't know, uh, in the soldiers or maybe uh, to hell with the devil era. I can't remember, but 85, 86, somewhere in there. Wow. Cool. Nice. Other than that, I was driving around in a, a broken down Pinto station wagon. So. <laughs> Pinto. <laughs> you nice. didn't get hit in the back yeah. end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. 
the cool thing about the pedo, the wagon, I could fit two SVT cabinets and a head in that thing. And it, was, it got me around. And, Just think uh, if you would have had a pacer, you could have built a hoagie or did a circumcision. Well, I used to drive. Uh, I was like the designated driver back in the day. So myself, Tommy Lee and, and Donnie, who was in my band Stormer, my old band Stormer, Wow. We'd all be driving around in my pinto to, to go to Hollywood and, and hang out. <laughs> so, wow. What color was the pinto? It was silver. Nice. Silver. Yeah. Right. Mind you, his cabinets weighed more than the pinto, I'm sure. Yeah, they did. <laughs> <laughs> I, believe, I believe that for sure. Steve, let's keep it with you for a bit. All right. Another question I have for you as far as in, do you have any fond memories on that tour being the first, you know, nationwide tour? Yeah. With soldiers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was the first time we, no, actually it wasn't. I gosh. So yellow and black attack, we did a lot of van driving and yeah. uh, we had like a, a bobtail truck, you know, a regular truck that, you know, we, we had a driver for that and we, uh, we did vanning. And so, uh, yeah, I think, uh, on soldiers was the first time we got a bus tour bus and, um, our crew guys were, were all seasoned pros. We had Kevin Dugan was our, our road manager. Who's Michael Anthony's base tech and a yep. um, bunch of guys that just had been around for a while. So it, it was a lot of fun, you know, and, um, good memories uh, nice clubs and you know we played small theaters and clubs and just you know did our thing it was good awesome right on man for sure bobby why don't you pick it up brother so i'm gonna go deep i'm gonna have fun right here so tim you were a groundbreaker and and you and i talked a little earlier offline and i know the gentleman is watching Congratulations on 27 years of this album, you know, yes. Mr. Doug Pinnock. But well, Doug. you, Doug, uh, were groundbreakers in the Christian community. You know, uh, Doug was working with Jerry, with Morgan Cryer. You guys just came out. You were the ones who really started the ball rolling. You know, after you, it was the White Cross with Rex Carroll and everything else who sounded like mm -hmm. Rex. But you guys sounded like yourself. Pinnock was another one. When King Zex hit, nobody sounded like it. Right. And um, it, I, I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, look, you know, there, there were a lot of bands coming up. You were the first Christian metal band to play the rainbow, you know, to play the whiskey, you know, it, it was. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, we were, when we were doing it at the time, when we started, it was just something we had already been doing the Hollywood circuit. So, you know, we already had a sound and, and, uh, um, you know, back and then, I gotta then, say, I'll interject right now, Tim, yeah. you guys didn't just have a sound. You had your own sound which was exactly. the coolest freaking thing that set you apart. And, and I love that about you. Even now, you know, that, you know, you're not in the band, but you, there's a striper sound. There's a Van Halen sound. Yeah. You know, you yeah. hear that nasally guitar, you hear that drive. I know what it is. As soon as I hear, you know, soldiers, I know it's a yeah. freaking striper tune. Well, I mean, Oz and Mike were influenced a lot by, uh, you know, Priest, Judas Priest, and uh, Boston, and uh, Kiss, and and uh, Van Halen, of course. So it was like everything was kind of a mixture of those those bands and uh, you know, big drums and the whole thing. But of course, you know, the look also, the uh, the yellow and black stripes. We made our own cabinets, you know, dummy cabinets, and we had this whole yeah. stage set up that we took into the clubs way back in the beginning, and and uh, you know, made everything look bigger than it really was. And and uh, you know, we might have all these cabinets behind us, but we had like a little speaker that we played through, you know, and that was actually being <laughs> <the end> <laughs> nice. <laughs> but it created your tone. 
Uh, you and I also talked a little bit offline. Look, the first time that I was dating a girl back in the early when I was into that, but uh, in 84, uh, oh. when Yellow and Black came out, but 85, you guys played at uh, a, a very eclectic person's resort in <laughs> Jim and Tammy in uh, Heritage. Uh, Heritage you, USA. Yeah. Yes. PTL Club. You know, yeah. and if anybody knows about Tammy Faye Baker, J Jim Baker, <laughs> air conditioned dog houses, everything. Look, I got invited to go down because they called it. It was, oh, like Jesus Six Flags. You got to come down here. Yeah. When I went down, you guys were playing one night. And I was like, check this out. I got yeah. some rock and roll and a water slide. Yeah. I, I, they, they, had a, <laughs> they had a stay at their place so they, you know, to save some money because we're still uh, up and coming. And so it costs a lot of money to stay in hotels and oh. keep a band on the road. So they, they put us up in their hotel. They gave us... Uh, free rooms while we were there, and and uh, the thing was, our our crew guys drank and smoked, and you know they were regular guys, and it's like they they were miserable because they couldn't do anything for you know. <laughs> it was like no smoking, no drinking, or no bar or nothing. So, anyways, uh, but they they were great to us. Uh, they, you know, they brought in a chef and made uh, after the show made made us like hors d'oeuvres and and had this personal chef come in and make us like shrimp and whatever we wanted, you know, and they were, uh, very good to us, but, um, uh, yeah, it was, those were the days. Those were some fun times. Look, before I throw this to Angel, one thing I, I, I really want to say, Tim, look from the heart, you and I look, my background is, mm -hmm. is that group. It, it, it's deep rooted in that. Look, I have my faith and everything, everything, Everybody goes through life changes, yeah. but you guys were there. And a lot of people of our audience were there when we needed you. Look, you know, the eighties were a weird time. AIDS came out this and that. And then you guys popped into the circuit and I'm going, this is kind of cool. This is different. Look, I love Priest. I love everything that I was into, Van Halen, everything. But you guys really stepped out and stepped off the ledge. And I got to say, and not to be crude, but you kind of gave the metal scene the big middle finger of like, we're doing it our way. Yeah, and we did. Yeah, and does. thank you. You know, really, it you was know, great that you had the, you know, kahunas to do it. Did it our way, uh, not only for metal, but I mean, for, for the church in the sense that, you know, we weren't going to allow the Christian church or, or the establishment tell yeah. us what to do. And um, at any rate, we, we did our own thing and, and uh, I think it was pretty successful, you know. Uh, well, I think it's great because you definitely set a groundwork for a lot of bands. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, White Cross, uh, mm -hmm. Baron Cross, uh, Blood Good, all the bands that came up through that period, Pinnock, yeah. everything. You gave a lot of people more courage to go out there and go, hey, look, I don't need to be ashamed of who I am. And I, I think that's great on any sense. And being in this day and age now, you, you got to be commended for it, brother. Thank you. Well, thank, thank, uh, thank God that he uh, allowed us to do it because we were we were a bunch of knuckleheads. You know, we it wasn't anything that we did. We just uh, we just followed the lead, I guess, of the Lord. Hey, look, I'm I'm not going to get preachy, but look, if if anybody who reads the Bible, Quran, or whatever. There's a lot of knuckleheads in those books, but they did some good work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, look, if somebody can talk to a donkey, I'm game. <laughs> I'm the biggest donkey, whatever. 
<laughs> nice. Me too. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So uh, we can see that so we got some fan questions that are about to pop in. So I'm about to kick it over to Angel. But real quick, I'm going to throw something at you, Tim, that I think would be kind of yes. cool to talk about real quick based off uh, something you had just said based off one of Bobby's questions. So we had J.D. DeServio on the show not long ago from Black Label Society, and we were talking to him about how the Black Label Society battle vests have really kind of taken on a thing of their own in this real kind of like cult following, which just started off as just their basic stage attire. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about just, you know, the, the black and yellow of Striper and how that started, because, you know, not – before your departure from the band, you busted those outfits back out again for yeah. a, a tour to commemorate them. So talk yeah. a little bit about the history of Striper and the Black and Yellow. Yeah, well, uh, they were doing that Perhaps. before I, I joined the band. There was a band, uh, they, they had a band, it was called Rock Regime. And uh, we were like rival bands. We played together all, all over the you know, L.A. scene. And, and uh, so... They always had the yellow and black. That was something that Robert came up with. And um, it just went from uh, the backdrops to the clothing, his drums, the guitars, everything was striped yellow and black stripes. So when I got in the band, we, we made our own costumes at first. I mean, we put stuff together. We go find a, a shirt that was striped, you know, white and black and then we'd get the uh the dye yellow dye and we dye everything dye our shoes we had like bands shoes that were striped you know and stuff like that so um we didn't have any money in the beginning so we did everything ourselves and and uh the guitars were actually yellow and black tape electrical tape put on the guitars and then there was a like a urethane varnish kind of finish that they put over it and that's something that Robert did for my bass. It made it sound terrible because it was encased in like encased in rubber. So it didn't resonate. So oh. my, my normal wood bass, you know, it sound great by itself. But when you, when you put the tape and the, the this, this urethane, uh, like a rubber sealant on it, it, it sounded terrible, but yeah, I mean, back in the day, you know, started off, we starting off, we, made our own clothes and then uh, as money started coming in we had budget for clothing we had this this uh i think it was the la rams at the time cheerleaders had a, a clothing store uh for uh dancing dancers um so like the capizio shoes and all that kind of stuff they made spandex clothes for us in the beginning and then uh, those were our first striper official striper costumes that were made by somebody and then uh of course later on ray brown the, the designer to all the the bands of the 80s and he's still plugging away he he made all of our uh really cool costumes from like the Tahel era on yeah and uh yeah so cool times and and uh, the look and everybody knew us by yellow and black stripes and yeah. Of course, there was that one period of time in uh, 1990, the uh, uh, against the law era, where we kind of got rid of the stripes or the yellow and black, I should say. We still had stripes, but it was just kind of toned down. Um, so that was that's it, you know. Hey, hey yeah, Tim, man. I gotta interject sure. real quick. How yeah. uh, during that period when you guys did that departure? You threw in a cover tune, which I have to say was so badass. You guys went funk. You went, yeah. you know, you you hit every, I got to say it was the donkey punch. And it was like, oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, what it was. Is, what made you start. go that route? It was just, it was an idea that Mike had and, uh, you know, at the time we were we were all just hanging out for like eight months together and, and Robert had like a little rehearsal room in his house and we'd just hang out every day, play pool and watch you know, TV or whatever, watch movies and, and the song I'm talking you know, about is Shining Star. Shining which Star. Is... So we were writing the songs for, for Against the Law and then he was I, I think I, I got this idea for uh, for Shining Star and he came up with the riff, you know, and uh it just developed from there. 
So yeah, it was Michael's. It was Michael's idea. I, and and I, look, I gotta say one thing. Thank God you guys didn't play it like four white guys. It was, so, it, it, it was beyond chili peppers for the time. And I kept going, this, excuse my, kick ass. I was like, okay, I get it. I, it I know turned out guys, great. So there, on a side note, um, there, there was three white guys that played on it. And Randy Jackson uh, played bass on that song. Really? Yeah, wow. so that's Randy Jackson playing playing the bass on that thing, and uh, he came in uh, as a favor to uh, Tom Worman, um, and they were looking. The way I was playing it was just I was just doing the riff over and over again, and then in the verses I was still playing that that riff, and, uh, and he wanted something different, and uh, wanted I didn't know what he was kind of looking for, but Tim, did he, you clap on the one and three? On the what? Did you clap on the one and three? White people on the one and three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he brought Randy and you know, took it to a whole nother level. It was really cool. But I, I mean, really, what a great album. I, I love that you guys put that album out. And it really was a shocker to the system. Yeah. That. It, it was people you know, thought like, oh, they're all going to hell now. I'm like, oh, no, they're not. I, I think it, for me, for me, I think it's probably my favorite album that we did. And uh, unfortunately, the time that it, timing was, you know, uh, late '80s or it was, it was like '89. It came out in '90, so you know, everything was changing at that point, and the music was more. Uh, Guns N' Roses kind of, you know, heavy, grungier type of music. And then they went to Nirvana and that whole Seattle sound just kind of took over from there. So um, it's the wrong time for us to to come out with that. And I mean, we grew facial hair and, and uh, tried to look a little more tough than, than what we were. But, <laughs> you know, it was fun. It was good times. Well, Kiss uh, tried that it. too. Look at yeah. you look at that period. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Bruce, really? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm a macho guy. <laughs> I'm like, I really want to hear YMCA break out when you guys yeah. all did that. <laughs> nice. Angel, man, let's kick it over to you, brother, and let's give a little bit of love to the Metal Summoners and to Tim's oh. fans. Yes, a lot of love. Uh, damn, where do I start? But... I do want to bring up something really cool. And I know it's three o'clock in the afternoon in New Zealand. So just want to thank you, um, Amanda. Amanda. I'm, I'm Craig sending you lots of love from New Zealand. Oh, and Craig O'Hagan. I know, I know Craig. I don't think I met Amanda, but I, I know there's Craig. Hey, Craig, what's up, buddy? Haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Three o'clock in the afternoon up there. So. That's awesome. Thank he, you both he, so much. He raises his own cows. Craig what does. I don't know, but I I know that he uh, he raises cows. Nice. He's got. <laughs> he, Craig is probably I I don't know he he's probably the biggest striper fan uh, that I know of because wow. he's followed us all over. He's come from. Uh, New Zealand to the States. And then he's traveled all around. He's gone to practically every show, uh, that we've done in the States. Um, on, uh, did, did he come on, uh, to hell with the devil tour on the reunion? I can't remember, but throughout the, the mid two thousands, he's been at, at many of our shows and he's traveled with us and, uh, he's a good guy. Uh, we've seen him in, uh, Australia. He, he kind of pops in wow. every now and then. So, Good guy. That's awesome. Yeah. Guess making cows or selling cows or raising cows is good money. Yeah, I wish. I, I think he uh, he uh, makes his own food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So One we're gonna go. Deserves, deserves an utter. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we're gonna go. We're gonna go from New Zealand <laughs> all the way to Toronto. Toronto. So our first question. Get it, Candy. Greetings from, from Toronto. Toronto. What was the first concert you ever attended? I the first uh, real concert that I uh, 
actually got tickets and uh, went to was Thin Lizzy uh, Jailbreak in wow. know, 77 or 8, somewhere around there. Me and my uh, my best friend Greg went and they played at uh, the Pasadena Civic Center in uh, Pasadena, California. Cool. And I band, uh, there was a band called Snail that opened up for him. Oh. So, so I'll start. <laughs> there you go. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> Before that, it was probably uh, uh, bubblegum bands like Paul Revere and the Raiders or something at, like Disneyland or Disneyland. So, you know, stuff like that too when I was younger. Uh, uh, don't mind Steve. He's growing, he's just doing his um, cat meowing. We don't know why he does that. He, he does moon. that to get attention. Yeah, he That's does that because he does that around the time of the full moon. He meows like a cat. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna go to somebody. We don't know where the hell he is. Matt Porter. He could be yes. in California, Cancun. Uh, yeah, I would go Pennsylvania. Wink. <laughs> I was gonna say Alaska. Uh, what was when? Oh, sorry. Where were you the first time you saw yourself on MTV? I think. Wait, I don't remember. I, I think we were probably at, at uh, Michael Sweet's house at his uh, at his mother's house, uh, Janice, and um, I think we were all in the living room, anticipating our our debut. Well, now, which know. single was that, Tim? Was that called? Uh, the first video that we, we did was for uh, Soldiers Under Command. And I can't remember if that ended up on MTV or if that was done on some other networks. But um, uh, let me think. Uh, uh, the first video that I remember that we did on MTV, I think, was uh, Calling on You. Yeah. That's what I remember in Snyder, D. Snyder breaking your chops on it. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Typical D. Yeah, you got to love him. Uh, go to, uh, Robert, your favorite tour you were a part of? <laughs> that I was a part of. Um, probably, uh, let me think. Uh, first, uh, first half of uh, In God We Trust tour was was huge and um what a fun we were with white lion at the time uh wow. they, they were opening and we just we all had a good time we were just hanging out and having a blast nice what a great band and and it's a shame yeah. they're not around anymore Vito. yeah uh, yeah yep love me i don't somebody. feel bad steve's hair is not around either so <laughs> it just it just moved down yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I saw White Line at Lemoore's too. Nice. Really? They were, well, dude, they were like the house band for Lemoore's, man. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And then I also saw them up for ACDC. Nice. That was pretty cool. Just back to one, one nice question from our, our Matt crew Porter guys. Again. Oh, sorry. I was sorry. just going to say our, our crew guys used to give them a, a hard time because. Uh, Pride, their album Pride had just come out. And so we had uh, one of our road guys, tour manager or somebody, he'd, he'd make up signs and stuff and put them up on their doors, like Pride go with before fall and, and stuff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> we don't play jokes on each other. It's fun. That's fun. Yeah. Uh, Matt wants to know, do you feel that the label Christian Metal or Christian Band helped or hurt the band? Yeah, I, you know, I think we kind of, we kind of fell into the whole thing anyways. Uh, we promoted ourselves as, as a Christian or as Christians, but we always wanted to be known as just a band that had Christians as members. So, yeah, um, I think because of Christian Metal, in a sense, or even metal for that matter. I mean, uh, people would look down on us or we wouldn't be accepted um, in the in the regular scene. You know, the Christians loved us though. I mean, we had all kinds of uh, kids come out from churches and stuff like that. And they, so, I mean, it was kind of a, I don't know, they, they, they 
they didn't have an outlet for for the Christian kids to to listen to a lot of the music that they liked, you know, the style of music. So when we came out, it was kind of a big deal. But yeah, so, I mean, even to this day, it's something that I, I think that they're trying to play down as far as uh, being metal in a sense, or even uh, Christian metal. I, I think they just wanted to, and we wanted to be known as a rock band that uh, that. Uh, was consisted of Christians. So. so Tim, I was with Matt Porter today. We were at college and we were talking about a couple of things. Mm -hmm. You guys played the, the Tower Theater in Philadelphia. I think Hurricane opened up when Matt was mentioning it. Yeah. And um, there were protests out front yeah. from a lot of Christian things. Because the thing you guys did, different than everybody else other than guitar picks, you throw out New Testaments. Yeah. And they were like, oh, these guys are the devil. And I'm like, oh, my God, really? The same people who yeah. protest you know, soldiers and everything. And Matt was bringing it up. And I'm going, really? You're yeah. arguing about people. I'm going, it's not like they're throwing a bong out in front of you, you know. <laughs> or, you well, know? It, it happened everywhere we went. I mean, I'm kind of. I, I don't remember too much in, in Philly it happening there, but definitely in, in the Bible Belt, it was definitely, you know, every night there was bull horns and signs, you know, pictures of Motley Crue and pictures of Striper being held up and saying, what's the difference and stuff like that. So it's like we took heat from the leaders, a lot of the leaders, you know, uh, what's it not fall all the... Um, Jimmy Swagger was one of the guys that uh, look. that really yeah. laid into us on on his TV show, and you know, so we took the heat. But you know, you expect that we we expected that from the world in a sense, but not from the the church community, and and that's where I think we took more heat from them. Look, you guys, were, like I said earlier, were the groundbreakers, and everybody always looks at somebody's flaws. Mm -hmm. You know, they love you when you're on top, but as soon as you start to slip, and again, I'm going to go back to a good friend of the show, Pinnock, when he did that comment, man, they talk about somebody who became a eunuch for the whole thing. It, they snipped him off and, and I'm going, yeah. really? Yeah. Here's a guy, African-American, 71 year old, still kicking ass the way he is and i'm going yeah i want to be doug <laughs> <laughs> doug is great yeah I, i've loved king's x from the first album and they're, they're but you know what favorites. i mean you guys really when you were the wakers and shakers you were doing isn't that what it was all about isn't what it was was breaking up the norm and and really trying to get and, and steve any of us you know non-religious people people uh, i i think whether you look at the bible at that way going wow it was really about isn't that what rock and roll is trying to go against the grain yeah it's uh i, I guess we were rebelling against a system in a sense mm -hmm. but we were rebelling against the satanic system <laughs> that's that's you know the the uh, heavy metal satanic thing you know we were trying to do the opposite you know we were trying yeah, to but, you know this. nobody's gonna take away your passion you know somebody doesn't give you a gift and go well i want you to be a ballerina dancer well yeah. i'm not a ballerina dancer yeah i'm a rocker and yeah. and that's what you guys did and when you came out you went this is kind of cool. Okay, it's different. It's something I never heard before. But you guys really broke up the norm. And yeah. uh, I think you scared the hell out of parents, <laughs> which was great. You were kind of like the Elvis of the 80s, if you we think were, of it. We were, to a lot of parents, I think we were also a relief, you know, that their kids didn't have to listen to the music that they were against. So, yeah, I mean... It was groundbreaking, and uh, I can't say we were the first to do it, but I mean, there were. It was the first to be uh, 
you know, to take off and do the whole MTV and, and all that stuff. I mean, you know, when that happened, everything just kind of exploded. And yeah, yeah. Was probably, uh, like I said, that was calling on you, you know, that to hell with the devil era of where everything just kind of. Well, you got to be very proud of yourself for everything you've done. Look, you know, we, we could, and, and that's what I said earlier on the show. You know, there's a lot of news companies who could dive deep and go to the, you know, he said, see, you know, let's go this route. I'm going, no, look, the four of us are here and we're very thankful you're on that. Look, you were a groundbreaker. That's why we wanted you on the show. You did something that right a lot on. of people didn't have the kahunas to do. Yeah, well, I think it's a calling in a sense, you know, where we were called to do what we did. And I don't think everybody could have done what we did without having the backing from God. <laughs> you know, that was that was really what it was all about. Uh, I couldn't have but, done it. I mean, I and, was, and I got to say, especially in the L.A. scene. Dude, yeah. you're out there with crew and everybody else. You could have got your butt kicked. Well, I mean, <laughs> the thing was, I, I came, the band I was in before Striper was was a band, a pretty big band in L.A. called Stormer. And, Stormer. and we were a party band. I mean, we were, you know, like I said, I was hanging with Tommy and, and Vince. And, and uh, I mean, that was like what we did. We went out and we we raised heck you know and and so for going from that scene and then getting into striper it was just kind of because those guys knew me from before and then they knew me uh after my conversion to christ and uh you know hopefully they saw a difference but i mean uh yeah it was it was kind of weird because they knew me and i knew that they knew what i was like back in those days so yeah um uh, you know, whatever. Very no, cool. Hundred percent, hey. absolutely. No, hey. totally, brother. Let's bring it back over to Angel for any other Kurt uh, fan questions from this segment, and Angel, your question as well. Yeah, we still got quite a few to to get through. No uh, worries, man. Do it up. With Noel, when you were on tour, who was the most interesting band that you toured with? Interesting band. Um. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably the the loudness guys. I mean. They, they they didn't speak English, <laughs> and we just kind of like nodded heads, and we, you know, and and laughed and smiled a lot. So it was it was kind of one of those things where we didn't talk to each other, but we just you know just kind of yeah you know hi you know hi. it's a good way yeah. it's a good way to get, it's a good way to get along it's a good yeah. way <laughs> no they were they were great I mean it was a lot of fun but they were yeah they were probably the most interesting you know because. We, there was a communication gap between the. Between All right. The who was the most odd band that you said, oh, get me the hell off this tour? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. I can't think of anyone. You know? Oh, you everybody, have one. Come on, dude. Everybody was fun. I mean, we, we all. No, we you have that good. one you're going, oh, really? Nah, I, I can't. I can't think of anybody. I can't. Oh, I mean, we, I, I, got to think. I mean, in the, in the beginning, we we toured back to back with Hurricane. So I mean, we did two two yeah. tours with them. Um, I think we toured with Armored Saint, um, uh, TNT, Loudness, um, who else? Um, White Lion and Jet Boy. I can't remember. Well, you did Tease and all the little bands, but. It, yeah. There's got to be that one band that you just kept going. Really, dude? Who was the hell the promoter on this tour? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I can't think of anyone. You're, you're, you're running out of bait on your hook there, Bobby. I don't think I you have was just did. thinking, I'm, I'm like, did they put him up with, you know, like, uh, uh, oh, my but, God. What, who's the guy who does the upside down cross on his head? Uh, King Diamond. No, King yes. Diamond, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, yeah. speaking of bands and tours, uh, we do have Paul that would like to know, who was your favorite Christian band that you did shows with with Striper? Some of my other favorites were Baron Cross, White Cross, Petra, Sacred Warrior, Bride, <clears throat> Bloodgood. Very cool. Yeah. Um, 
Wait, we, we did shows. With, we didn't do too many shows. We toured with Bride, um, I think, in 91, and uh, they were a lot of fun. Uh, we did some shows with Blood Good. I uh, can't think we ever did anything with Petra. Uh, and we did shows with White Cross and, and uh, Baron Cross. But, um, yeah, they were, all, they were all good guys. But I think the ones we hung out with the most were, uh, were uh, uh, Bride. Yeah, they were they were a lot of fun. Nice. And we have a question from David Rosenfeld. Do you have any favorite songs or riffs from your time in King James? How did you get involved with that man? Hey, I can't think of any of the songs right now because it was it was such a short time. I was I was asked by uh, Rex in '94 to uh, he wanted myself and Robert to to yeah. be on the album. And so he, he wanted the striper rhythm section at the time. And uh, so he asked us to come up and we, we went to his place and learned the song he recorded. And, and uh, um, we did a video for a song called Hard Road to Go that was probably the most com commercial of, of the songs on the album. But um, yeah, so that's, that's probably uh, the one song that, that sticks in my mind because we, we went to Nashville, did a video for it, and you know, it was a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, that's how we got together. Uh, he, him and Jimmy uh, wanted to put a, a band together, Christian new version of uh, a White Cross type of band, and, and uh, they asked Robert and myself to, to join. When it came time to tour, I, I declined because I was uh, I was just getting a new gig, starting a, a steady job at home, and this was after Striper had already disbanded. So uh, I declined to tour with the guys, but uh, I did do that first album. Nice, right on, man. And Brian has a weird question: uh, Do you remember Robert's Rod Stewart tribute? And if so, do you remember? Buddy Ray, um, no. just Buddy Ray. No. Robert Rod Stewart trivia. I don't. Sorry. <laughs> Robert did a Rod Stewart. <laughs> I don't even know what he's talking about. Sorry. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I have a question from Jen from from Philly. Uh, she wants to know who inspired you the most musically um players or or bands or whatever i i guess um uh, i was probably most inspired growing up by uh elton john and uh, his rhythm section was uh d murray and nigel wilson ah and uh Davey. d murray was probably one of the reasons why i i started playing bass when i was wow. younger yeah so i mean we're going back to you know the, the early 70s and so that was that was it, probably Elton John, and then I I like so I like bubblegum bands when I was a kid. So it was like if it was Partridge Family or uh, the Monkees, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so I mean that's but it was it was music. I mean you you listen to stuff that was on the radio and and uh, you know 1970, 71, and whatever it was like that. That's the kind of music that I was listening to at the time. And it was like way later when I started getting into, into harder bands, um, um, late 70s. Uh, well, who was 80s. your bass influence? Who was the guy who got you into bass? I mean, you talked about. Oh, uh, D. Murray. D. Murray yeah. from Elton John. Um, and then from there, it was like, I, I, I mean, for some reason, I, in my mind, when I was a kid, I wanted to play piano and be, uh, be a, like a singer, piano player, Elton yeah. John kind of thing, minus the the gay part but um i i just what you know, i like the music and uh and uh, i like harmonies and i like uh just the good songwriting <laughs> so anyways you know it was that and then later on it, it it was like bands like uh zeppelin and and uh um i started getting into the harder music uh sabbath and um Nugent and Aerosmith and you know just all the bands that were out in the in the in the late seventies. 
Now, here is Frank a very Marino funny. Marino and Mahogany oh. Rush. That was another guy. Frank Marino. Who was the bomb. Nice. What was that, Angel? Go ahead, brother. I've never, I've never seen this question before, ever. And this is a fun question from, from Robert. What was your favorite city to play in and the food that you loved from that city? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, man. Uh, That's a good question. You know, I, I love uh, playing in, in Japan and Tokyo, so, uh, and I love Japanese food. But my, uh, my favorite food is probably Indian. I love Indian food. And I did have, uh, we played in India, and I had Indian food in India. So that was. Oh, nice. That was good. Uh, Amanda wants to know, how many times have you been to New Zealand? Um, I think we've only been the one time. And that would have been uh, 80, maybe twice, uh, 87, 88, somewhere around there. Um, we, we would play Australia several times. And Australia? I several times. <laughs> several times uh, we went down there in the 80s, and then I think we did uh, we played in Auckland once, maybe more than that. But that's what I all I can remember. And my question Craig, was, Craig would know. Ask Craig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Craig. Uh, yep, he does know. He just posted an answer twice. Um, twice. Okay. Yep. All right. So there you uh, go. Thank you for that update, Craig. We appreciate it. <laughs> Exclusive. <laughs> And uh, my question to you is, many musicians play different, besides rock music, they play different types of music. As a bass player, are there any types of music besides rock that you actually play? Yeah, I play jazz. I play, I, I play everything, just, you know, I, I like jazz, I feel it, it's like part of me. Um, but um, I like regular rock, I, I like anything that has a groove to it. Um, you know, I, I like dance music, uh, like the seventies disco era. I mean, I like all kinds of music. So, um, yeah. <laughs> right on. Absolutely. Well, fans, we're definitely going to make sure that we kick it back for another segment. So keep those questions coming. They've been absolutely fantastic so far. So we really appreciate your guys' participation to keep this super duper fun for Tim, super fun for you guys. So keep the questions coming. Psycho Steve, let's bring it back up to you there, my good dude. So we covered pretty much a lot in a short amount of time. Of course. So the bands that you listened to yesterday, what are the current bands do you listen to today? Uh, I like, uh, today I like, uh, guys like Flots, Flotsam and Jetsam. Um, nice. they were one of my, my, uh, favorite bands that I started listening to maybe five years ago. Okay. Um, uh, they got some great stuff. I didn't listen to their earlier stuff until recently. Um, and then I still go back and I listen to old music. I like old 60s and 70s music. So the last album I just bought was uh, Mahali's Greatest Hits. So, <laughs> so okay, that's, that's, you know, I don't really listen to much music nowadays, new stuff. Nice. Sure. And can I ask another question, Jay? You want to go yeah, absolutely, Steve. Go with it one more time because uh, Bobby okay. and I have something queued up. Okay. And the other question is, with all the bands that are out today, is there any musician that is with us or that's not with us you would love to like jam with or record a song with? Mm, yeah. Um, oh boy, that's, there's a lot of guys that I, I'd like to play with, but yeah, I can't think of, I can't, my mind's like blank at the moment. So I, I couldn't really say, you know, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. If you think of it, just we'll come back to it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll pick those. Yeah, absolutely, okay. no worries, man, for sure. So before we get into this really popular segment that we've been doing um, over over our couple of years now, that really goes over well with the fans. As kind of a segue into that, your signature bass came out through Overture Guitars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you got involved with them and what, and talk a little bit about what your specs were, like what did you want in your signature bass? Yeah, so I had been playing um, Status Graphite at the time, uh, 
since yeah. the 80s uh, and uh, uh, well, I can't remember his name. Uh, anyways, I, I had I had one custom built for me and they brought it out to me. Um, and I played that bass up until uh, 2012 maybe. And uh, Justin Hoffman from Overture hit me up and he had been hitting me up for a while to want me to play his basses. And I'm just like, I, I play this bass. I play the status bass. That's, uh, yeah. you know, and so he said, well, I'll make it to the specs, you know, whatever you want. So I said, well, if you can make me a bass that has the same neck and uh, same pickups and everything that's in my status. And, and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So he, he, uh, he went ahead and he took measurements of, of my uh, status and it's a kind of an interesting neck because it's more of like a, uh, I don't know, it's got, it's, it's, uh, it's like a D shape, but it's, uh, thinner on, on the bottom side. Yeah. So anyways, um, he made the neck exactly the same as my status. And then, uh, we put electronics, uh, status, uh, graphite pickups and, uh, uh, preamp and everything. So he built me my first base and did a custom paint job on it with, with like tribal stripes, you know, tattooed kind of stripes. And I, I think he said his uncle is a tattoo artist. And so he actually came up with the, the custom paint for that. So that was my, the first base that he made me and it played great. I had a drop D tuner on it and yeah. uh, sounded great. And that became my next base for, uh, from like 2012 up till uh, till the end there, so uh, the next nice. four or five years. But uh, we we went into production with those things and uh, debuted them at the NAM show. I can't remember what year. Uh, it was uh, 14 in Nashville. Okay, yeah, that's right, Nashville. And then uh, we did Anaheim right after that. So. Um, so I, you know, he, he did one-offs with them. He, he did custom orders and I, I can't remember how many we sold, but, um, wasn't too many. Um, then he did this other base for me. Uh, that was like a hippie sandwich, just really nice woods, uh, uh, abalone inlays and crosses on the, on the neck. And it's got little lights, uh, markers. So you can see your, your neck, uh, in the dark when the sound guy turns on the turn off, turns off the lights. Or not the sound guy, the lighting guy turns off the lights and you're like sitting there trying to figure out which, you know, am I going to start the song in, in, uh, you know, G sharp or am I going to be in it, uh, a or whatever? You're just like trying to figure out where you're at in the dark. So I had him put lights, little led markers on my, on my neck. So just a little custom thing. Um, and he built uh, a third base that was a little bit smaller body. So, uh, those were the three bases that he, that he made and uh, well you also had a headless bass you played for a while i was just that, about to go yeah. there and ask about that, that that's the status graphite uh okay. rob green uh is the guy who builds those uh and they're custom made in england each one they're handmade and uh, but he he built that for me in 86 or 7 and uh so that was, I was trying to find a sound. I was playing all these different basses, trying to, you know, Aria Pro. And then uh, I, I played Spectres and uh, I think I had a PV bass and a bunch of different basses. But I, I just wasn't getting the right sound. And when I got the status bass, we just got it. And, you know, I didn't know what it sounded like live. But that thing plugged into an Ampeg SVT just was like my sound. That became my sound. And good. Nice. Anyways, that's. Love the status graphites. They yeah, and, and look, they're starting you know, to become they're hard to find. And you know, yeah. I, I've seen them around. And anybody who's a bass geek, mm -hmm. you know, chase it because they, yeah, they know they know what they are. Oh yeah, they're because they're was, easier to find now in the states than they were you know thirty years ago. But you know, they're still yeah. uh, you know he he does one off, so they're it's, it's made to order, and I think he's like six months out. Wow. Well, it's, it's interesting, too, because that was one of the reasons I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about that graphite headless space, because uh, a couple months ago, 
headless guitars were kind of becoming a talking point again because Joel Hoekstra was playing one yeah. um, on a bunch of shows with TSO. So it was just kind of rekindling people's kind of curiosity in headless guitars. Me personally, I'm a bass guy. It's what I play. It's what I do. Um, Headless guitars are are not for me. They're just not really my style. They're they're a little like the way that they're weighted without the headstock is a little different mm -hmm. for me. Um, so that's kind of like my thing for it. I always have this running little joke when I see some of those guitars of headless where I'm just kind of like, ah, where's the rest of it? Like, yeah. um, and well, all it's that. Definitely, kind of stuff, definitely but, it's definitely something you got to get used to. But yes. Uh, at the same time, it's like nobody's there standing in your way when you when you move, and it's like you're not going to go out of tune by hitting you know the cymbal stand or something. And true, uh, they they are weighted um, in a way they don't fall. You know, some bases are like headstock heavy, and, and they yeah, you know, you're like you know, like a T bird. I had a T bird T bird for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, it was like every time I let go of the neck, my arm started to hurt because. You'd let yes. go of the neck and the thing would drop to the ground. So for sure. Um, You're definitely right. the status. You know, I was looking at Steinberger at the time and they were just like two square, you know, little like a two by four with a neck. And then uh, status graphite. Somebody was playing one and I, I uh, oh, no, I, it was a guy, uh, the bass center and, and uh, Chris Mowry was the guy who turned me on to that. He was uh, uh one of the guys at the base center out in uh, California and LA when they were uh, like the, the big deal. And nice. uh, so he, he turned me on to status graphite. So I give him the credit for that. Oh, right on. Very cool. All right. Well, we're going to kick it to this fun little segment. Angel, if you'd be so kind, my good dude and make Bobby the big screen. Um, oh, so fans, um, we always enjoy doing this and, um, uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun um, with Bobby and Tim bouncing a little bit of action off each other. So uh, ah. we're going to cue it, kick it to our segment where it is. Tim, um, Tim Gaines, how well do you know your wood? Yeah. How good well, do you know your wood? How good so do you, you know your wood? You mentioned about Overture Guitars. Yeah. And you and I talked a little bit offline about a gentleman who worked with them and there was a little controversy and we're not going to get into it right now. So I'm an artist who's endorsed by uh, JD out of uh, Roswell, Georgia, Warrior Guitars, love him to death. Yeah. So JD made me, he's going to make 33 of these, but this is number seven. And I had to bring it out tonight uh, because of, it, it's a friend of ours. And that would be this guy. Wow. Wow. That's beautiful. They're all oh, handmade. Yeah. All the wood came from Israel. Wow. So it's acacia wood. Uh, there's a purple heart right through the center. Yeah. All hand carved. Uh, EMG. They're called the crown of thorns. Wow. And uh, wow. JD did these and, and just uh, amazing piece of art. I, I play this I probably. A man, oh, I wouldn't play that. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Beautiful is right. Uh, it, yeah. It, if, if you can see this thing, it, it's just. Wow. Is it heavy? No, it, it's extremely light. It, it's great. My buddy Neil Zaza played it, but uh, JD does some great work. And as I showed you earlier, uh, this is my signature that he did. But then we'll get into bases. I want to see how good do you know your wood? But. Uh, <laughs> So this is called a, a uh, Michael the Archangel that he did. Very nice. And uh, In yeah, some beautiful work. Very really nice, yeah. All right, got to go here. We talked about this gentleman a little bit earlier. So, Very cool. you know, if you're going to give somebody a cigarette, this guy might be the guy. But <laughs> he might tell you to go see Gretchen. A cigarette. Yeah. Very so cool. That, that would be our Dougie. Yeah. Very nice. Tim, come on. If you're a oh, bass player. Yeah. <laughs> That's a nice one, man. I had a I had a, the lawsuit Ibanez version of that um, from, from the 70s, but it was a look the same. So this is a 62 Paul. Wow. Very cool. 
And then uh, wow. we talked about a couple things. Look, ah, this guy. The Very iconic nice. bass line that probably, you talked about people, you know, Elton, who made you want to play bass. Yeah. This guy made me want to play bass in sixth grade after hearing Toys in the Attic. Soon oh, as I yeah. heard Tom yeah. play that freaking line of. Yeah. <laughs> When you heard that, it was like, oh, my God, puberty just went right out the window. <laughs> it was like, what the hell is that? Yeah. He, Steven Tyler, Joe Perry, Brad, and Joey Kramer. Yeah. Look. I mean, that was. Look, everybody. Can he, say, he, oh. was playing, he was playing uh, Stingrays when they first came out back in like 77 or so. And that's why I started playing a stingray was because of Tom Hamilton. But you think about that. Think of those songs that, you know, where you were, there's so many Aerosmith rocks. I, I told Joe and those guys, I'm going, dude, you don't understand. When I heard those tunes, I can remember everything from my first home run at little league to yeah. getting my first kiss <laughs> and whatever <laughs> they, they were there like yep. you guys in the 80s i remember you know jim and tammy with you <laughs> uh a couple really good iconic guitar basses i have here uh let me grab oh you got more than me <laughs> wow, all those. i have a lot of wood yeah. uh, <laughs> yes we know um so you talked about jazz, and, and this is a nice, very wholesome Yamaha. Ah, uh, is that a Yamaha? How many, John, John Patitucci. That's a Patitucci. Yeah. How uh, many strings is that? Six. Six, six string bass. Wow. Yeah. And and what and Tim will tell you what what a guy. Uh, another guy we've had on the show, and a gentleman I'm I'm currently working my album with, uh, Martin Montnick. You know, there's just something about a sound like this you can't get anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, just incredible, you know. Very uh, nice. Show them all. One, <laughs> oh, wait, wait a second. One more. That okay. will take These are his children. children. Yeah, we don't, we don't quite have enough time for that, but we'll definitely. <laughs> all right, we'll go this one. So yeah. this was a gentleman who played with Mr. Satriani. And it was his signature bass yeah. with Fender. Stu. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it That's was funny. Stu's. It, it's an urge. But did it, have, did it originally have those pickups? Yeah, did this was the, this yeah. was the urge too. This was okay. the second uh, configure. Basically, the cool thing about it, it's a jazz and a P. Yeah. So yeah. one last bass, and I brought it out a couple times. Look, I'm a Philly boy, so I live here and I'm close to Norristown. And if you don't know who this guy is, you need to put your bass away. <laughs> wow. Good luck with that. Uh, Some people on, have Tim. Robbie has Tim. guitars. Tim. Oh, man. You got a Jocko. Ah. Uh, nice. Come on. You know, nice. who can look? No finish, no nothing, no yeah. frets. No frets. Oh, my God. This thing is, you know, you just want to play Joni Mitchell tunes all day yeah. on this damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jocko, if, yeah. if anybody loves bass, I mean, look, this thing's beat the shit and yeah. Norristown and, and what a hell of a tragic story. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But, it was uh, hey, Sunrise, Florida, I think is where. where yeah. Was. yeah. Hey, where Tim, look, that's what I said. Don't discredit yourself. Look, mm -hmm. you are in a category with all these gentlemen. And, you know, you need to pat yourself on the back because, look, you did shit that a lot of people like ourselves wish we could have done. Look, you were a groundbreaker, mm -hmm. dude. And, and, yeah. That is the coolest thing, 
you know, yeah, how many people strange. can say they did that, man? Thank you know, you, there, you know, there's a walk that. on the moon. There's a guy who played Christian rock on MTV. Yeah, dude, don't don't let anybody steal your thunder. So, yeah, nobody does, man. I I promise good. you that. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. Perfect. So there you go, man. You're in this well, category. You. You're in this Hall of Fame. You're, you know, look. Hell yeah! Very cool. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much, it. man. Absolutely. Bobby, excellent job as always, yeah. man, for sure. It's always such a fun segment. Angel, perfect timing on the regrouping. Let's kick it back to you for some more fan questions. Uh, definitely fan questions related to the base. So we cool. I saw <laughs> one in particular that uh, had to do with slap that I think might be kind of interesting. Yeah, Robert... I'm actually going to go back. I thought he said questions. somebody wanted to ask if he was going to slap Michael Sweet, but you know we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to. That, that Bobby, that this Bobby. always happens, <laughs> and I have to put on a straight face and <laughs> ask the question. I never have one. Bobby gets to do the easy part. He just gets this <laughs> to. <laughs> okay, let me put on my straight. Let me not say that either. Well, let me get to the question. Thank Angel, you. read the damn question. That's what I was getting ready to do, damn it. <laughs> well, I'm having deja vu for the last few weeks. Okay, I play slap on bass. What's the best model to do that with? Best model to play slap, I would say a Stingray, Music Man. My opinion. I was going to say the Michael Sweet model, but... Oh, the Michael Sweet. Uh, <laughs> no, I won't, I, won't, I won't go there. Bobby. But, uh, Sorry, music man, Stingray, uh, Fender Jazz. I mean, those are probably my two favorites. Nice, Bobby. Stop messing with the family show. Okay, now we have a <laughs> cool question from from YouTube. Be cool or be podcast out. Were the rumors that Striper and Slayer were going to tour together back in the day true? No, no. Never. It was never going to happen. I mean, it could have happened, but I, I don't think it would have happened on their part. But um, we did. Uh, did we do any shows? For them? No, I don't think we did. Um, yeah, that was just a rumor, like the heaven and hell kind of a thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, with, uh, I think there were some other bands that possibly that we were supposed to tour with also that are supposedly toured with. And it never happened. And I don't think it was ever going to happen. Hey, hey, Tim, real quick, did you ever do any of the gigs out at uh, Cornerstone with uh, Res Band and Glenn Kaiser? Yeah, we did. Uh, gosh, it was uh, 2000, I think. It wasn't, we didn't do them in the beginning, but we did one, I think, in like, 2000 or 2001. So I, I work with a drummer and a great guy out here. He's played, he did Glenn's solo album and everything. And mm -hmm. I, I've did a couple things with Res Band and that, but Glenn, look, if anybody wants to check out a, a excuse my French, a mofo blues rock yes. kicking guy who will, you know, look, he, Larry Norman, th yeah. th there are, are so many people, you know, look, don't discredit that's the hard part. Steve brought it up earlier and Matt Porter did. <clears throat> Do you think the title hurt you? Because putting that label of Christian on there really puts a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth because yeah. it goes disco, this, and you know, everything gets shoved in a box. Exactly. And, you know, there are so many great players. Larry Norman, just the, the yeah. crap that he did. And Glenn all those guys back in the day. I mean, they were they were like, I don't know, before before it got all commercialized and everything. I mean, those guys were all playing stuff. Keith Greens and and Larry Normans and uh, second Mylon, chapter, I you know, did so. I, I did a lot of crap with. Look, I took DeGarmo and Key, those yeah. guys, to the uh, playoff game of the Phillies in '93, and it was you know after a gig. But yeah, we did nice. shows together in Europe. I, I think we did a few shows with them. So, Whiteheart, you know, mm -hmm. I, oh, yeah. you know, so many great players out there. Yeah, 
and but they and got thrown in a box. They got thrown in a box, and unfortunately, but I mean, it was it, they were also marketed strictly to Christian a Christian audience. So unfortunately, that's you know, I, I think DeGarmo and Key wanted to get out and and do stuff like on MTV, but. Um, you know, everything was on Christian labels and they were sold in Christian bookstores and, and not in record stores. And, and uh, it was hard to find unless you were a Christian. And it was hard to uh, find out about any bands unless you were a Christian, you know, and it just happened to be in a Christian bookstore and see, you know, the album or maybe hear something on the radio, you know, Christian radio. But for the masses, no, it wasn't it wasn't marketed to the the masses it was just a small group of people jay i'm gonna throw it back to you but i gotta say this sure. to tim and it's a little off color <laughs> but i gotta tell you when i used to go into christian bookstores it almost felt as bad as going into an adult bookstore <laughs> it was like one of those places that you know you didn't want your friends to see you walking into <laughs> oh, yeah geez. really it was <laughs> if you think about it you know the only difference is no glory holes but you know that was about it no. right well i don't know was, you know you went but into really, one of those places for a certain thing so i mean you're going there to find religious material yeah, but nobody music. you know you it, it was a hard time in the <laughs> 80s in that period to different now i could give a striper album to anybody the For 80s sure. was hard. Everything was kind of on a category. Mm -hmm. You know, you were either here, or there, you were a metalhead, you were listening to the, and I was like, this sucks. Yeah, yeah. I, I love was, the kids nowadays that I wish we had it, that they don't give a rat's butt where they go. Oh, this is my friend. They don't go, this is my black friend, this is my gay friend, this is my Christian friend, my Jewish friend. Well, we only do that around Steve, but, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Angel, let's bring it back to you, buddy, for your question from you or any other final questions from the fans in this segment. Uh, my question to you is when you, when going out on, on the road and in the studio, what was your, your go-to base for playing on the road and in the studio? Yeah, okay. Yeah, on the road – was the, the status graphite the headless base i mean that became pretty much my go-to for everything um i recorded a little bit with it but i in the studio uh it was usually a p base or um a uh there was a yamaha a bb cheap cheap base a bb 300 that recorded really well really yeah but uh in the later albums uh, it was uh usually a p base in the studio nice again i have to ask us is the, with the bass was it like four string five or or six string bass? yeah i always played a four string um i did i did a tour with richard marks um in 2007 wow. and i had a five string and it just really jacked me up because i wasn't used to that low b i was always going for something on the e string but i'd be hitting the b string and, and messing up but um that was the only time I can think of that I that I played a fiber, uh, but I uh, I do a drop D tuner on most of my live bases. So I, if I need to hit something lower, I will flip the little switch and and get into drop D. Or I have a jazz bass up here that I I have tuned B E A D rather than E A D G. So I still have it's like a five string without the without the high G. So, Tim, what is your status base? Which one is that? It's a uh, Series 2000. Series 2000 status graphite, uh, which uh, now resides with a, a good friend of mine, a collector who, uh, since I retired the base, he's kind of put it in his collection and uh, takes good care of it. Oh, you missed out on that one, Bobby. No, so, I'm on reverb right now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, fans, just to let you know, it is last call for alcohol. We will have one more final segment of fan questions should any more come up. But this is your last chance to get any questions or comments that you want uh, to be directed at Tim. 
this is the time to get them in. So it is last call for alcohol, guys. And thank you, as always, for being so involved. Psycho Steve, let's kick it up to you, my good man. So you just mentioned Richard Marks. Yeah. I want to know, as far as in playing with him, how did that come about? Well, uh, at the time, I was living in Nashville, and um, I had been doing some shows at this coffee place uh, with his uh, keyboard player, who was also his music director. And I guess they, they had needed a bass player for uh, a tour, and uh, he hit me up. And uh, that's pretty much it. We played uh, around the States, you know, the United States, and we did some shows in the Caribbean. And, uh, it was just a few months, but it was a lot of fun. Good experience. Wow. Nice. nice. And, Rob, and then same thing with, because um, we, we brought him up earlier <laughs> with, of course, you said that you might be on the album or you're not sure if you're yeah, on the album. Yeah, with Aldo. Um, yeah. So because of all this whole lockdown, um, he would send me stuff to track on and uh, some, we did some video stuff uh, for his, uh, his uh, music channel. And, and, uh, but yeah, I, I did some tracking and I'm not sure what's going to end up on the album, but I know there's at least one song that, that he seemed to like that I, that I did. So um, we'll see what happens, but yeah, I think he's got a new album coming out and uh, I think he said March or April. Sweet. Nice. Right cool. on. He's a yeah. good guy. I, I love Aldo. He's probably one of the, uh, I don't know, I, I don't want to say underrated, but he's just, he, he's a phenomenal uh, songwriter, musician, all around musician and uh, producer. And it's just a, he's a nice guy. He's, he's a really good guy. We had a, uh, a guitarist of his on a show, Jack Frost. Yeah. Yeah. Jack. Yeah, well, he joined the band uh, last year. I think it was last year. Yeah, uh, and then uh, so I I left in I think it was January last year or February. But uh, so yeah, we were gearing up to do this tour uh, in the summertime, and of course everything got shut down again. We had planned the year prior to that also, and uh, when COVID first hit, and then everything got put on a back burner, and then it's just you know. Everything is in limbo. Who knows? You know, yeah. who's going to be touring, and you know, yeah. it kind of sucks. For sure, absolutely. So one other thing that was pretty cool, uh, Tim, that we definitely need to talk a little bit about is let's talk a little bit about Breakfast at Timothy's. Yeah, yeah. yeah I want to yeah, talk about your solo album, man. Back in like two thousand nine, and um, and just talk talk about like what your vision was and for what you put out. Cause I mean, I love the song stir crazy in particular. Yeah. But talk, talk about the album. Let's talk about your, your solo work. Well, it's, it's kind of a, it's not so much a solo album as much as uh, it, it was a collaboration with uh, actually it was more than a collaboration. My, my good friend, Chris Eddy, who uh, lives in Nashville. His dad is uh, the guitar great Dwayne Eddy. I don't know if yes. you guys have heard of Dwayne yeah. Eddy. I mean, that low baritone kind of oh. sounding guitar. So we, I, I had, uh, I, had, I had, my time uh, was being taken up doing other things uh, other than music. And I was like telling Chris one day, I, I said, man, I'd really love to just work on something like a solo album, album. And, and, uh, this was in 2007 or eight. And uh, like a week later, he starts sending me songs. He's like, Hey, I wrote this. You, let's, you know, this is a good, you know, song for a, for a bass, you know, and he started coming up with all these songs. So he actually wrote all the songs for this, this album. And I played bass on, uh, it's pretty much his solo album. And I put my name on it and I played bass on it, but I, I played lead bass and, and the same, context that his dad would have played uh you know the guitar wow. um, it's not fancy you know no. billy sheehan kind of stuff and it's more uh of an album where the the lead bass is taking the place of what a, a vocal might do a lead vocal so um we had a lot of fun we we recorded the, the album in his garage 
And at this point, I wasn't even in Striper. I, this was 2008, and I didn't rejoin the band until late 2009 or 10. So my my uh, plan was uh, with Chris, we were going to record this and just release it and maybe do, you know, and try to do some tour and you know, like club tours and, and just see where it went. And then I got asked to rejoin Striper. So I kind of put the whole thing on the back burner for, for a few years. And, um, but uh, yeah, we did, uh, we did the songs in his garage. It was, you know, we, he played uh, drums, played the guitars, uh, some keyboard parts. We had other keyboard you know, Nashville session guys come in and play horns. And uh, um, it was, it was a pretty cool experience just, you know, and it was low budget. We did everything. You know, if you saw his drums that he recorded with, that was like microphones taped to stands, and yes. you know, not not. But we also had uh, a great, great mix engineer that mixed the album, David Sapiro, who was a guitar player in Blood Good, um, and uh, he had just finished. Uh, he just finished mixing the uh, the Little Big Town album that was uh, popular at the time. So um, he, he got a good sound, uh, I think, with just getting everything mixed right and, and uh, getting the bass not too far out front. But, you know, just everything was, was perfect in the mix. He did a good job. Oh, that's awesome, man, for sure. Do you still have, like, some of the Breakfast at Timothy stuff um, with, like, at home or? The, uh, the CDs or? Yeah, or, whether it be CDs or just. Yeah, I. I think finally sold out of uh, CDs um, a year or two ago, and right I never on. bothered. It, I made up a thousand copies in, initially, and it took me almost ten years to sell through those. <laughs> Not like everybody I, wants I, to. I understand that through. part. Yeah, so it's like I, I may, I, I get more uh, people asking for them now than I did back in the day. So I may make up another batch, but uh, cool. may may do some vinyl also. Nice. Um, we and it's been 10 years so uh we we may uh well they are available also uh you know digitally wherever itunes uh, <laughs> itunes yeah <laughs> I, say, I i haven't hello I haven't received a dime from any of that stuff in like five six years so it's like i gotta go hunt somebody down and and see if in that if the cd baby goes. i'll do it for you. Being, yeah yeah absolutely yeah. for sure and so another project that you were involved in, with for a little while was um, of Gods and Monsters. Um, yes, right. So talk, uh, talk a little bit about how you got involved with, with them and the, the work that you did with them for the time you were there. Right. Uh, well, Kevin Goocher, who's the singer, and he, I guess him and Joey Tafoya um, yes. wrote the songs together. Joey's a great guitar player. Uh, and, amazing. And uh, Dean Castronova was on drums. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what a beast. We, yeah, Dean's great. And so uh, we just recorded. Everybody recorded at home or recorded their parts. Uh, Gucci came out to my place and uh, we laid down bass tracks and then uh, they mixed it. And, you know, we, I didn't know when it was coming out or anything. It just kind of happened. And then we did some shows and uh, it, it was cool. And then, uh, did our last shows in, uh, Jan I think it was January 2020 or 21. Where are we? 22? Yeah. <laughs> this is 22. I, it's like, it's, it's all a blur now, man. Everything's a blur. So uh, I guess it was 20, 2020. Uh, we did, or 21, sorry. Uh, we did our shows in January 2020 and uh, 21. And uh, after that, everything just kind of closed down and, and we just stopped and they continued on. Uh, Uter continued on. He's got a whole new band now. Uh, Dean, of course, is back with Journey. And yeah. Yeah. Joey, I think, is is getting into uh, uh, firearms training and some really cool stuff uh, doing competitive shooting. All right on, man. That's super duper cool. Well, we definitely want to respect your time. And so we're getting ready to put a little bow on everything. So, Bobby, why don't we kick it over to you? We'll then kick it to Angel and we'll sure. we'll give our hugs and kisses. So, Tim, like I said, I, I really have to commend you and thank you a lot for giving us your time tonight. We had a lot of laughs. Everything was done in humor. I, I hope you feel respected over yeah. that. But again, you were... 
me coming from the past, look, I was a youth pastor years ago at Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia here. And I know you were involved with Calvary Chapel, which, yeah. uh, and I knew Chuck Smith pretty well. Yeah. Um, where, so how did you get affiliated with Calvary Chapel? Um, a friend of mine started going there in, uh, 82, 1982. And, uh, I saw how radically his life was changed that it, it, I started going too, <laughs> and it changed my life. And, uh, um, I got out of the band that I was in because uh, I saw God moving in such a, a strong way in my life. So, I mean, that was uh, 80, end of 82, early 83. I got it. I started getting involved with Calvary Chapel, uh, West Covina, which was Raul Reese was the pastor at the time. Yeah. And, and look, was, I, I love Raul. And the movie that he did, yeah. the documentary on Raul Reese, look, I, I mean, if anybody is going through anything, the great thing about it, I have no qualms about any of that. And it, it, it is part of our history. But, uh, yeah, I loved when I, I seen that. I'm going, wow, this is really cool. I didn't know yeah. Tim was part of Calvary Chapel. Yeah. And I knew Raul. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm with Joe. I was with Joe Foch. And, you know. Right. Uh, I, was just, I was just reading about Joe. I got one of the books, like one of the early Calvary books from, like, the beginning days and reading about Joe. And, um <clears throat> At any rate, I, I started going there in 83, and then when I joined uh, Striper, late 83, um, I got the guys to start going. They started going there, too. And, uh, I mean, at the time, they were just watching. They were watching Jimmy Swagger. <laughs> that was their church. <laughs> and, uh, Here's the so, funny thing. Look, I came from a whole name it, claim it. I was at a Pentecostal church, all that. That's how I got wound up at PTL and... Yeah. You know the '80s were so screwed up. Everything yeah. it was like, it was like our bad acid trip, and it was like you think yeah. everything was so weird. I I kept going, uh, 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 what? And then I met Joe Foch, and I kept going, and he and I connected, and Joe was a guitar player, and this and that, and Joe and I hit, and he goes, "Hey, why don't you play guitar here?" And I'm going. Okay, this is, and a lot of people who know me on the show, look, this is, I went to Bible college. I did a lot of things. I have a degree. I wear a lot of effing hats, but that's what life is. It's yeah. experiences. And I, I, I love that we have Tim on here to talk about it. Uh, yeah. And I think it's so cool. I will nev never discredit where I was or push it under the rug. It is who I am, and it made me who I am today. And Calvary Chapel did that. And I love Joe. I love Chuck when he passed. Uh, you know, when Chuck passed away, I, I I felt like a part of me died. You know, yeah, it was kind of like my grandfather. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, it, it was uh, Raw <clears throat> Reese. Raw, when I met him, I kept going. First time I met Raw, I'm going, oh, my God, the dude from Cheech and Chong got saved. <laughs> I was like, I thought he was the biggest stoner for Jesus that I ever met. And if you ever hear me go, dude, come on, man. It was kind of, it was like yeah, was a way for a bong to come out. Well, the, the cool thing about Raw was I grew up in the church. My dad was a Presbyterian minister. So... I've had it my whole life. I've been around it and I ran the opposite direction for the longest time. And when I uh, started going to Calvary, the first time I met, I met the guy, I met Raul the first day I went there and I didn't even know he was the pastor. He was just some guy wearing blue jeans and, and a shirt and t-shirt. And then he gets up and starts speaking and he, he started teaching it. They were teaching at the time in, in the book of revelation which I had just fascinated me that, you know, all the end times prophecy and everything that's going on today. Like he was talking about 35, you know, years ago or 39 years ago now. And uh, 
I've, I've been into it ever since, just the end time stuff. And, and uh, so anyways, it took that for, you know, a guy that just plain guy, you know, wearing jeans and a t-shirt and not a... a Hawaiian uh, shirt. Everybody was... Hawaiian so shirt, I got to yeah. tell you, one guy who blew my doors off and I met and changed my life forever, Gail Irwin. Yeah. And Gail was, yeah, sure. had a big nose... You know, Gail was kind of that very jovial. He looked like the snowman on Frosty. Okay. <laughs> he was part of, and it was that guy who, when I did a couple things and I told him, and it was right when King's X put the Lost in Germany, the King's X oh, yeah. out. And we were up in Rochester, New York at a retreat or something. And I put it on, I'm going, he goes, you know, Bands like that will change people's lives. And I just kept going, wow. And I told Pinnock yeah. that. And I kept going, Doug, wow. You know? Which, they wrote some, uh, they still do. I mean, he, he writes some. From the heart. Videos. And from Dude, the heart. It's he, when it comes from here. Yeah, and you guys did it too. You know, you didn't do it to preach. You did it. And that's why, you know, even though you're not in the band, you're still the band. You will always be Tim Gaines, Striper. You know, it's yeah, going to be that guy. 35 years of my life was, 34 years of my life was, you know, associated. And still is in that sense, you know, even though I'm not. And we got to commend you for it. Dude, <laughs> you, you know, look, you did a lot of crap that a lot of people wouldn't do. And you stepped off the edge. So... Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely, awesome. man. We really appreciate it for sure. Thank Angel, you. let's kick it to you real quick, bud. Anything final from yourself or has anything popped up from any of the summoners? Yeah. Um, just what advice would you give um, to anybody that is picking up a base and just simply trying to learn what advice would you give to them? Learn as much as you can style wise. I mean, listen to everything. I mean, some guys are just into you know, punk or whatever. And they, you know, they think bass is going to be easy because they can just play straight lines, uh, but learn all kinds of music and go back to the, the earlier stuff from the sixties and seventies and, and just listen to what a lot of those guys, John Paul Jones and John Deacon from Queen and get James Jamerson. Jamerson. Okay. And we go back to Motown and, yeah. and, 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 uh, you know all the all the guys from LA and and I mean all the music from the Wrecking the, Crew and Wrecking all Crew. Oh. The you know whatever was you know Jocko was the one who said it. Every anything that was played on the radio, AM pop radio back in the in the day, sixties and seventies was just like you know the best time for music. But anything that was played on sixties AM radio, you got to think that what it was mixed for, it was a little six by nine speaker in the dash of a car and to get those kinds of sounds the bass you know like jamerson for instance you know coming out you know so present in the mix on a little tiny speaker uh, you heard everything that was Jackson going on five. The i mean yeah oh. <laughs> absolutely 100%. And, and look not to discredit tim your bass lines. There are so many iconic bass lines there. Look, you're up there with Geezer Butler and everybody else. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I'm going to kick your butt again. And I know <laughs> you don't like to toot your horn, but dude, you did a lot of things that people chased after. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I just, I went along with the ride, you know, it was a, it was a, well, it was ride a good ride and I on board and, yeah, you know, it's like, uh, what can I say? It's, I, I don't, I can't stand listening to myself. I don't like to hear myself play. You know how it is. It's like you go into the studio and it's like they play your, you just lay something down and you hear it back and you, you like just rip it apart. You're just critiquing everything. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't listen to my stuff. I, I have a hard time doing that, but, um, you know, it's, it's, Dude, yeah, your baseline on calling on you is there's so many lines that you did, and I kept going. Wow, that's well, a I mean, that stuff, you know, like I said earlier, it was, you know, the, the to hell and, and God we trust was a, was another guy, a studio guy that came in 
Brad Cobb played all those parts. So it's, but you know, I did everything live and, and uh, I was in the videos and um, you know, that was, it was all, it was all good. Absolutely. Well, man. We well, love that you're part of our history and yeah, part of our lives. Absolutely, man. We really appreciate you, Tim. And thank you for making some time out of your day. Like thank Bobby you. said, yeah. that's always a big thing for us is that you felt respected, you enjoyed being on the show, and that you felt that this was worth your time. Yeah, man. Thank you, guys. Appreciate awesome. it. Now, Tim, before you, we brother. cut you loose, brother, for anybody who's looking for you, where can you be found? Um, I'm pretty much on Facebook, uh, Tim Timothy Gaines Official, or, yeah, oh, you guys got it. Yep, I got it right down on the screen. Um, hey, Tim, real quick, I'm going to throw yeah. this one out, and the guys will do it. Look, I, I, I own a studio, but I know a lot of people always look for – session players and we we bring it on with a lot of our guys if people are looking to record and do things how can they reach you to go hey tim i'd, I'd like to bring you on hire you on to do a track would they reach yeah. out to you that way yeah i mean you can shoot me an email um my stuff's on on uh contacts info contact info is on facebook or email me at base track 777 at gmail is my my Gmail, Very cool. my studio stuff, but awesome. yeah, um, I'll be doing it. Awesome. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, Tim, thank you so much again, brother. Enjoy your afternoon. Enjoy your evening. We can't wait to have you back on for any projects that you do and, or just to be able to rap with you again, man. It really was an honor and a yes. pleasure awesome. to have you, man. Thank you. It was an honor here. Too. Thank, you, thank you guys so much fans. Thank you guys all so much for tuning in, supporting Tim, supporting the show. We really appreciate it. If you're loving what we do, make sure that Facebook and YouTube, you're subscribed onto it and follow it and notified on it. Since that's where we go live, that's definitely where you want to be. But we are also on TikTok. We are on Instagram and we are on Twitter as well for all of our guest announcements. Speaking of guest announcements, the new one is on Friday. It's going to be a banger for next week. It's going to be a great episode. We got something very fun planned for next week, but we always have something fun planned. That's why you get such bitching episodes like you had tonight with Mr. Tim Gaines. So on behalf of thank the you, Metal Summit, again, thank awesome. you so much to Tim Gaines for spending your evening with us. And on behalf of the Metal Summit, for Bobby Dreyer, for Angel Alamo, for Psycho Steve, I'm Jay, and we will see you guys next week. Guest announcement on Friday. Enjoy your rest of your week, guys. Stay safe. Enjoy your weekend. As always, you've been watching the Metal Summit. Thank you, Tim. All right.